Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. You're the real Christians that made it out on... Wow. I love it. The first fruits of your increase, right? First hours of the first day of a new year. What a blessing to be here and to serve the Lord together, to uh, be loved by Him, to rejoice in the grace that He makes known to us by His Spirit and how He develops in us His person uh, manifested daily in our lives. Uh, And I'm just glad that He does, that He continually, patiently, graciously works in all of us all the time. Amen. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have of coming into your presence, studying the Bible, learning and growing as a result of your grace. We do pray, God, today that by your grace that you would allow us to learn, that you would equip us as we learn to have your word engrafted into our hearts so that we may manifest those attributes of your truth and of your person in our daily lives. Lord, we recognize that we are frail and that we have nothing that we can offer you, but you have offered yourself for us and you empower us and you live in us. And uh, Lord, we live our lives in surrender before you as a result of your grace, just the same. Uh, You're working in us all the time and we're so glad. And you do that, Lord, in spite of us, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our shortcomings, overcoming our propensities and our humanness uh, by your grace and by the power of your spirit that dwells within us. Today, Lord, as we study the scripture, we ask that you would make known to us the realities of your passion, the things that you did in your sufferings on behalf of sinful man to bring us redemption from sin and from death. And Lord, the prophecy and the fulfillment that we see in each of the details of these hours of your life. So climactic in so many ways, and yet pointing forward to even a greater climax when you come again and you reign upon the earth, and then when you make all things new, and then we live with you forever and ever. We thank you for those promises, those blessings that we do believe and we enjoy. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 67. Now, this has been a journey thus far, getting to this point. Jesus has met with his disciples. He had a last supper with them. He told them what was going to take place, asked them to pray with him in the garden. Uh, You know that it was there in the garden that he ultimately surrendered to the will of his father, Uh, Father, if there's any way, he's prayed, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And from that point, surrendering to all the activities that would take place from the arrest, the Romans that came out and arrested him, uh, being thrown in a pit, kept late into the night, taken out of the pit, still during the dark, uh, tried before the Sanhedrin, before the chief priests, Uh, accused, falsely taken to Pilate, to Herod, back to Pilate again. And now we get to a point in where Jesus will be mocked. He has been scourged. His body is literally mutilated uh, because of the scourging of the flagrum and the way the Romans handled prisoners and criminals. Uh, Jesus, of course, had no sin, did not cry out, um, thus angering the Roman guards even more so as they would be being Uh, They would be bringing this beating upon the Lord. His body is by now covered in blood. He's weak uh, and he is taken and he is made fun of. Three different occasions in which this took place. Uh, He did have a courtyard mockery before Caiaphas, uh, the high priest. He had a praetorium uh, uh, mockery in front of Pilate and with Pilate's guards and then also by Herod when he had been taken to Herod and he was mocked there in front of Herod. And so three different occasions, the Lord goes through a tremendous amount of suffering, adding insult to the injury that's already 
uh, been inflicted upon him through the scourging process as it was uh, designed by the Romans and then was uh, exacted upon the Lord uh, at the time of that scourging uh, through the command of Pilate. And so at this point, verse 67, they spat upon him, they spat in his face and beat him and others struck him with the palms of their hands saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And so we begin here, uh, we've passed through this passage before and picking up these various pieces in developing these scenes. Uh, we see that they spat in his face, a, a form of mockery, an insult. I uh, remember that Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the cheek, turn to them the other also. Uh, this is more than just being struck in the face. This is a, uh, a form of mockery by spitting in his face, and he does not strike back. He does not defend himself. He turns to them, as it were, the other also. They struck him with the palms of their hands. Now, this reminds us of something that we uh, know from the psalm, Psalm 22, where we will end up reading a lot of the information at a later time, but where Jesus uh, is praying as is depicted through the psalmist David in a prophetic sense and he cries out in the beginning of the psalm my God my God why have you forsaken me and it goes on talking about the attributes of the crucifixion but in Psalm 22 verse 6 uh, he says I am a worm and no man and we'll talk a little bit about that today uh, why would David say that? Well, he's speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit. But when he says, I am a worm, uh, that is an interesting phrase. Uh, when you strike at a serpent, what do you expect? You expect that serpent to strike back. Uh, not so uh, with a worm. You can uh, attack, if you will, a worm and it doesn't strike back. And Jesus refers uh, thus, in this way to himself, as a worm. I am a worm and no man. Within the context of this very psalm, uh, which speaks about his passion and his sufferings, he didn't strike back. He turned the other cheek, as it were. Uh, he didn't defend himself. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody were to strike at me, I would immediately want to block. I would be looking for ways to keep from getting hit. And yet Jesus allows himself to go through this in great humility, in great suffering, willingly surrendered to this process and this form of mockery that is exacted upon him. They struck him with the palms of their hands. We'll also read that they struck him with the reed that they put in his hand. And they prophesy, uh, they said to him, prophesy to us, Christ, and tell us who it is that struck you. And believe me, uh, in the annals of history, uh, we will note that God knows the names of every one of those that mocked him, every one of those that struck him. And certainly, uh, that, though it did not occur at that time, those names will be uh, brought up at the day of judgment. If you would now go to Matthew chapter 27, we're going to begin reading at verse 27. This is another of the occasions in which Jesus was mocked in this way. We won't be taking the time to look at the passages in Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, for the sake of our time today, as I've got quite a bit I want to cover, uh, but I do want to mention to you that there are details that will come up, and I'll add those in as we go through this process. And so beginning in this second mockery, this one uh, at the so hands of the soldiers at the praetorium. Now, the soldiers, verse 27, of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews." 
Then they spat on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. And so there's a lot here. Uh, we will begin by talking about the fact that this was at the Praetorium. Uh, this was a place where uh, the uh, Roman procurator would be living. Uh, and in this place, it was a place of trial, a judgment seat. We know about that. There was also a place that was known as the pavement, where Jesus was mocked and scourged. Uh, when we go to Israel and we take people to Israel, one of the sites that we like to visit is a place that is believed to be the, uh, the, uh, the pavement uh, at the Praetorium. And uh, this is an area where you can see carved into the ancient stones Roman games that have been played by the Roman guards as they're awaiting their opportunities to bring punishment to victims, prisoners, uh, or in this case, Jesus. And it's one of those places that brings me a great deal of humility uh, when I go there, in fact, recently in preparation for our upcoming trip in March, uh, I was looking at some of our pictures from last year and I saw a picture of myself sitting on the pavement and I could just see in the, the look of my own eyes that I was at the moment quite sober about the place where I was seated and thinking about the sufferings of our Lord. But here at the Praetorium, the whole garrison of these Romans gathered around him. And in a form of mockery, they strip him and they put a scarlet robe on him. The first thing they did, though, was to strip him, to make him naked. Now, when Jesus was crucified, it's believed that he was stripped naked. It is also believed that he would have been stripped naked during the period when he was scourged. They would strip the clothes off him and bare his flesh so that they would allow the phlegm to tear away at his flesh, literally mutilating him. And his visage, the Bible says, was marred more than any man. And so he was made naked for us. Uh, in the book of Revelation, we have in the third chapter, the story uh, message to uh, those individuals that are a uh, part of what is called the church of the Laodiceans. It was not the church in Laodicea. It was a church that was ruled by the people. It was not Jesus' church. And so in the church of the Laodiceans, there were no believers. And the Lord cries out to them from outside that church, knocking on the door, saying, if anyone will open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He gives them counsel to buy from him gold tried in the fire uh, solve that their eyes might be healed, that they might see, and that the clothing that they might be able to wear, that the, quote, shame of their nakedness would not appear. And so in this person uh, that is unsaved, this unregenerated person, uh, pictured as naked, exposed, uh, even as Adam and Eve, as re you'll remember, after the fall, they realized that they were naked. And they tried to cover themselves. They stripped Jesus in this way, naked. He identified with sinners. He himself humiliated in this way, publicly as a garrison of Romans gathered around him to mock him, already broken, bruised, uh, bleeding uh, all over his body from the phlegm. And now they're mocking him in this way. And they put on him a scarlet robe. Now, it's interesting to me uh, the passages that we read, if you're going to read through all four accounts in the four Gospels, you will find that there's a reference to a scarlet robe. You will find that there's a reference to a gorgeous robe. And that was the robe that was placed on him when Herod's soldiers did this form of mockery against the Lord. And then later we find that he is wearing a purple robe. And you might suggest that there's contradiction in the Bible, and I don't think so. I believe that there's a process here, both of time and of those things that were occurring in his physical body, as well as the typology that's being communicated to us through these things. First of all, when you consider the fact that the uh, gospel writer says that Jesus was clothed in a gorgeous robe, mocking him, this would have no doubt been at the time when he was mocked by those around Herod. 
and they put something that they could find there in that palace uh, inquire, uh, 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 enclosure, and they put this robe on Jesus and mocked him in the same way that they do here with the scarlet robe. The scarlet robe would have been something that would be easy to find in the praetorium, and especially around the pavement. Uh, the Roman guards would wear scarlet-colored robes. And so in that area, there would have been robes laying about uh, as they would take them off and on and uh, in their various duties. And so they grabbed one of the Roman guards, uh, identifying Jesus in that way with those Romans as well as the Jews as he suffers. And so they put the scarlet robe upon him. The scarlet, of course, uh, is a type of the blood that is shed for us in the scriptures. We see the scarlet cord and uh, the, the, uh, the teachings throughout the scriptures, this thread that's always communicated to us in the processes of the scripture from beginning to end and the bloodshed. And so they put on him a scarlet robe. And then later we find that uh, he is referred to as the one who has a robe dipped in blood. Now, of course, our minds naturally think of the redness of blood. But it's interesting to me that in the process of understanding these four gospel accounts and the timeline, by the time they put a scarlet robe on the Lord and by the time that he had been thus mocked, others are now reporting that the robe was purple. Now, if you take a scarlet colored robe and you soak it in blood, it has the appearance of purple. And so through the process of time, Jesus' body was bleeding in so profuse a manner that it saturated the scarlet robe and then took on the appearance of blood or of, uh, of purple. Purple is the color of royalty. And they're mocking him, calling him the king of the Jews. Uh, it's very interesting the way the Lord has hidden these certain things in scripture. And if we just take the time to, to stop and think about it and consider it. And so the scarlet robe becomes purple, uh, symbolic of his royalty. And there is a timeline event there that also will be manifested in time when he comes to rule this world as king of kings and lord of lords. And he will be clothed in purple and he will sit on the throne of David. And he will rule the nations. They twisted a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. Now, that's interesting to me as well because the curse is pictured by these thorns. Remember that after the fall and after the shame of nakedness was manifest, and then these uh, individuals, Adam and Eve, tried to clothe themselves, uh, later they are a given clothing of an animal, uh, and the, thus the bloodshed to provide for a covering for their sin, and then after which the Lord speaks to them and he talks to them about the curse. And a part of the curse is that their land and their plants would bring forth thorns and thistles. This would not have been something prior to the fall and the curse. And so Jesus himself became a curse for us. The Bible says, and cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. But in this case, he takes upon himself the curse symbolically through this crown, this mockery. Now, a victor in the games would be given a wreath around their head uh, without thorns. In this case, they make this wreath of thorns and they place it upon Jesus and they literally drive it down into the flesh around his head. Uh, long um, uh, uh, thorns that would have been forced down into his skull and the agony after already having been scourged as he had and already being mocked and beaten uh, now being uh, continued in the uh, continuing in this beating have, having put the scarlet robe on him and the crown of thorns upon his head and then a reed in his hand and the reed of course is a flimsy plant uh, staff. This is, of course, symbolic of the fact that Jesus will, in fact, rule with a rod of iron in days to come. And so while he is here in this humility, in this sense of brokenness, in this sense of weakness, uh, we know that ultimately in fulfillment, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. And we'll look at that before the morning is finished. And they bowed the knee before him, and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. 
And so they're bowing before him and mocking him. Uh, I find this very interesting because it was not genuine worship. Uh, they are noted in the other gospels as having bowed before him and worshiping him in this way. But it was a mockery of worship. There was no real surrender. There was no real love. Uh, it was that they were making fun of him and then calling him out, king of the Jews, in the, uh, a mockery f fashion. Uh, Jesus is, in fact, the king of the Jews, and that will be well known in days to come. And so in all these ways, Jesus suffers humility. They spat on him, verse 30, and took the reed and struck him on the head. Now, we mentioned the spitting on him already. We mentioned the striking in the face. Uh, and as I've mentioned already, I am a worm and no man uh, in Psalm. Also, we note in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, that he gave his back to those who uh, would smite him, and they plucked out my beard. Now, we don't find this in any of the four Gospels, but we do find it in prophecy and they plucked out his beard. And in this way is another form of mockery whereby they say, this is no man. He doesn't deserve to have a beard. Uh, look at him. He's not striking back. Uh, he is, uh, he's hideous. And as they're making fun of him and uh, with this reed, and, and they're beating him with that very reed, as we'll continue uh, and see. And then when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. And so taking off the scarlet robe that had, it seems, uh, then turned purple and then is reported as purple, having beaten him in the face, having struck him with their hands, having hit him with this reed, commanding him to prophesy to them who it is that has struck them, pulling out his beard, all these forms of mockery, the Lord in great humility and in surrender to the will of his father went through. And finally then, uh, allowing him to have his clothes put back upon him and then led away to be crucified. And of course, as we continue our study, we'll look in great detail at the next part of the event uh, beginning next Sunday. But there's something here that I wanted to give some focus to today. In the Gospel of John at this point, and again, as I mentioned, I'm not going to take you there and have you uh, review it with me for the sake of our time this morning, but we have Pilate having had Jesus scourged, having him clothed in this way, mocked and beaten, and then finally brought back into the praetorium, makes an announcement and he says to the crowd of Jews that are there, crying out for Jesus to be crucified, he says, behold the man. Behold the man. That just stood out for me, and I wanted to take the time this morning to really talk about what it looks like to be a real man. The way Jesus lived and the way he suffered, the way he died, the way he lived surrendered to his father. What does it look like to be a real man? Behold the man. And that reminded me of the passage in Psalm 22 in verse 6, where he says, I am a worm and no man. In prophecy, why would he say such a thing? Why would David pen those words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but to indicate the very way that people viewed him at that moment. He's no man. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, pull out his beard. They plucked my beard. He's no man. He shouldn't have a beard. What about the fact that they're striking him and he doesn't strike back? It would be natural for a man to protect himself, to, to find himself moving just to keep from being struck. And Jesus willingly took this. We would say today, that's no man. What a sissy to allow those men to do that to him the way he did. He could have called 10,000 angels as we sing. We know this. We know that he was very much fully God, even in his physical form as fully man. And he had laid down on 
omniscience, his knowledge of all things, and learned by the things in which he endured or suffered. He had lain, laid down omnipotence, all power. He could have called 10,000 angels, but no, he laid down that power. He willingly surrendered to his father. What humility, what self-control, what patience <clears throat> he demonstrated, knowing what was going to come. And what calling it is to you and to me on what it means to be a real man in a day that might call for something other than the kind of person that Jesus was. I remember before I came to a place of surrender before the Lord myself, saying, I don't want to be a Christian. People will think I'm weak. Oh, how foolish a statement. Coming to know the Lord is what it is to be a real man. Behold the man. And yet he says, I am a worm and no man. Pilate was really mocking him when he said this. Behold the man. He wasn't saying, this is a real man. Examine him and, and learn. He was saying, this is the man. This is your king. What in the world is this all about? Mocking him. Amazing. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and find some exhortation for ourselves. I recognize that as I walk you through this, I'll be talking about the attributes of being a real man. But there will be aspects of this that require us to give consideration to the women among us. And so let us bring application to both men and women. Uh, but we will talk about real manliness as well, because I would like to give an exhortation to the men among us as we begin this new year, uh, 2017. First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And so Peter, writing to these Jewish believers, tells them, you know, look, it's no big deal for you if you have done something wrong and you're beaten and you take it patiently. But if you have done the right thing and then you're beaten and you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Many of the Jews at that time were under great persecution, especially those that had come to faith in Jesus. And they are being called to patiently endure suffering, even as Jesus did. He says in verse 21, For to this you were called. You were called to patiently endure suffering, even when you've done the right things, and you're being accused of doing the wrong things. For this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. And so when we see this mockery, we see this beating, when we see this kind of abuse that Jesus went through and as a worm and didn't strike back, when he humbled himself to his father, he became an example for us of how we should suffer. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so he's exhorting these Jews. He's exhorting them as they've come to faith in their Messiah, Jesus, that they will go through difficulties. They've been away from the Lord. Now they're coming back and they should be prepared for suffering and to prepare themselves to suffer patiently during the process. Let's also go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we'll start in verse 1. What does it mean to be a real man? To patiently suffer. 
Turn the other cheek, as Jesus said. If they strike you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also. These mockers that will be judged, these that falsely worship the Lord and say that they're uh, worshiping with the words of their mouth, hail, king of the Jews, when in fact there was no real surrender in their lives. And now the exhortation to the believer to be like Jesus. These things were an example that we should follow in his steps. And Paul gives the same kind of exhortation to a mixed group of Jew and Gentile in the beginning of chapter 2 and continuing. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, in true humility, lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then this verse that you're so familiar with, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is who you're called to be. This is your worldview. This is the way you think. This is the way you process. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, made in the image of God as man, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Some translations render that uh, did not see being equal to God something to be grasped or something to be grasped for. I reject that translation personally. I like the, the way it's rendered here. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God because he was very God, very much God, fully God, even in his humanity. So to be God incarnate and in him dwelling the fullness of the Godhead bodily was no robbery to even say I am as he was accused and as he was questioned by the high priest are you the son of the blessed and he said I am identifying himself as fully God even in the form fully man in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those things in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so patiently Jesus endured this trial of suffering. Patiently he endured this mocking. Why? Because he knew the end. He knew what was yet to come. He knew that there was a resurrection coming. He knew that there was a time when his name would be exalted above every name. And that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow. And every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I always tell people when I read that verse, it's best to choose to bow the knee now. We willingly say, God, yes, I surrender to you. Allow your work in me. Do what you want with me. Rather than to wait until the day when you're compelled to bow at the great white throne judgment where unbelievers, every one of them will have such a full revelation of who Christ is that they will bow the knee. But it will not be in a salvific manner this will be their judgment 
and they will be cast forever into the lake of fire. What a tragedy that people would not bow the knee today, humbling themselves, being obedient to God, being a servant. That's what we're called to do, every one of us, male or female. So what does it mean to be a real man? See, we have a culture that tells us what manliness is. I kind of tease, I, I have men in my life that are around me here at the church or in other locations where uh, I, I find them to be much more masculine than me. Uh, I talk a little bit about Jess Phillips occasionally, uh, not here this morning, but uh, Jess works very hard in a physical uh, manner, as many of you do, and his hands are like rocks. I mean, when you shake his hand, it's just super hard, and I, I always uh, tease about being a real man like Jess. Now, of course, in this case, Jess carries the attributes of real manliness in addition to that uh, real kind of modern man look that we might look for in the world today uh, when, we, when we categorize and talk about real manliness. But I also know men that are old, men that are weak, men that cannot do uh, what they once did does that mean they're less than a man? That they're no longer real men? I find that the attributes of a, a real man can be documented so much more firmly and m much more beautifully than in just that kind of uh, machismo that uh, we might categorize as those kind of manly attributes that I, admittedly I wish I had. Uh, although I would also admit I prefer to push a pencil around than a shovel. Uh, and theref therefore, I end up with soft preacher hands, uh, you know. Uh, but what does it mean to be a real man? And how we sometimes even are tempted to w waver into the worldliness of what is called manly. And how we can fall. And I'll talk to you about that in a moment. So the attributes of a real man, I put four things together that I wanted to have you'd be able to take with you. The first one is that real men are obedient to the Lord. He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Real men are obedient to the Lord. Whether they have tough hands or a machismo look, if they're men that are obedient, that's the attribute of a real man in my view. I'm certain that is in the view of God. And so living our lives in accordance to the word of God, when we study the Bible, we don't just say, well, isn't that something? Or oh, those others should live that way. But it's pointing directly toward us. I couldn't help but think about that when I thought about these guys that surrounded the Lord and they began to mock him with this crown of thorns on his head and putting a scepter in his hand, a, a scarlet robe that then, then saturated in Jesus' blood, when they bowed the knee and worshiped him. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. What form of mockery? How easy it is for men today to say they love God. How easy it is for men today to say that they're obedient to God to say, hail, king of the Jews, and yet live a life of complete disobedience. That's not real manliness. Real manliness is to be able to make subject your flesh, your fleshly propensities to the will of our Father that is spelled out for us so clearly in the Bible. Obedience. Number two, we are called as men to be servants. I could give the same application, of course, for women. But men, the machismo man, is the man that's always commanding others around rather than being a servant toward others. I find that it's easy 
to command others, it is difficult to be the servant. And we, as men, are called to be the servants to our wives. We're called to be the servants to our children and our grandchildren. We're called to be servants to other members of the body of Christ and not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We are called to be humble, number three. We're called to be humble. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. Now, humility isn't being self-deprecating. It's not going around with a poor mouth or whatever and saying, you know, I'm nothing. Uh, no, that's false humility. But to recognize who you really are and our neediness will allow us, if we're truly and genuinely humble, to know that we're just like everyone else. And therefore, we're naturally going to want to be the servant to others because we will bear one another's burdens. We will lift each other up. We will care for one another. And so, number three, humble. And number four, an area that I probably struggle with a bit. Maybe you struggle with any of the above. I, I'm certain I do with all of the above. Number four, patience. If you're taking notes, let me just review those four things with you again. Number one, obedient to the Lord. Obedient. Number two, servant. A servant of others. And girls, I recognize the role of women and men are different. I recognize the role of a helpmate. I recognize how God has called you and equipped you differently than he has men. But men, that doesn't mean that you're the taskmaster and she's the slave. Amen, men? There's two of you. Amen, women? Uh-huh. See, I, I knew. Humble. Recognizing who we really are. You know how God allows us to go through the school of Christ to teach us humility, to teach us who we really are. And oftentimes, at least for me, this manifests itself in the area of patience. Admittedly, I read the Bible, I study the Bible, I teach the Bible, and there's not things that you could put your finger on in my life and say, Paul, this is where you're in disobedience to God. Uh, when, I, when you can spell out uh, in black and white the rights and the wrongs and walk in those things, uh, it's not that difficult. But when it comes to areas of character, when it comes to the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, patience, long-suffering, self-control, we find that we're falling short, aren't we? And so God allows us, even in the processes of learning the real manliness of patience, to learn humility. And so I bring to you an amusing story for the morning that will add only to the storyline of my own humility and lack of patience that might bring illustration to this. The staff have heard this story already, and so they bear with me as I tell it again. I, I told them when I told them about what happened to me that I would be sharing this with you, but I was saving it for today because I thought it illustrated so well uh, this particular lesson. Uh, recently, we made some staff changes at the skating rink, and um, Carl Dahlman and his family have been serving over there for almost three years, and it was time for them to be able to do some other things with their lives, and they've helped us so much. And so we put Jackson as the manager and hired Russell to be assistant manager. And in the process of that, of course, provided all the severance pay and everything to give them the proper send-off. And um, in the process of staff changes, you know, there's always the email changes or whatever things that take place, one of which was the fact that we provide our staff, some of them anyway, uh, key figures that need to be reachable 24-7 with a phone. And so we provided Carl with a phone, uh, and we have a, a, a church plan, and because AT&T requires a person and their social security number for credit purposes, not a corporate deal, it's on me. So the, the, all the staff phones are on the AT&T account with my name, and I'm the only guy that can get in there to fix it or change anything. And so Carl... Uh, which, by the way, brings me a level of impatience already because I wish I could delegate that off to somebody. I don't need to be the guy on the phone calling AT&T, you know? And so knowing the situation as it is, 
Carl calls me and says, hey, Paul, can you uh, turn our phones off? Uh, we're going to do our own, get our own plan. I said, no problem, buddy. And so uh, I put it on my to-do list, and I get down to where I'm going to make the phone call, and I get on the phone, I dial, you know, from my cell phone, 611. I think you guys know how this works. And uh, it takes me 45 minutes before I get a human. Now, I'm already impatient about the fact that I can't delegate this to a secretary or somebody, you know, being as prideful as I am. I mean, man, I have people, you know, I, don't, I shouldn't have to do this, you know. And so 45 minutes later, I finally get a guy on the phone. I said, hey, here are the numbers. Can you turn these off? No problem, done. So I think I've done my, my task, I'm mildly aggravated, but moving on now to other things like prayer and fasting. few hours later I get a phone call from Carl and it's, an, it's not a number I recognize but he calls in and says hey you turned off our phones and I says yeah isn't that what you asked me to do? He goes no 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 what I wanted you to do is I wanted you to take our phones off of the, your account and let us keep the same phone numbers but let, so that we can move them over to our own account. Oh I said I didn't realize that that was what was going on where are you right now? And he says we're at the AT&T store right now. I says, okay, I'm going to drop everything. I'm doing it right now. Don't leave. I get on the phone. 45 minutes later, I have a human. So now it's an hour and a half invested. By the time, I'm already under stress because I know that they're waiting at the store. They're standing there at the counter waiting 45 minutes later. So I finally get the guy on the phone. I says, oh, man, I made a mistake. Here are the numbers. You're, you, I know you're supposed to, I told you to turn them off, but that's not what I needed you to do. I need you to turn those numbers back on, but release them from this account so that Carl can go get his own uh, account for these phone numbers. And the guy says, no problem, take care of it right now. And so um, he, I said, why couldn't they just do that at the store? There are, the guy's over at the store right now. And he says, well, they can. They, they just obviously don't know how to do it. I said, so hang on. I'm going to call the store right now. So I've got my cell phone in my right hand, and on my desk, I've got speakerphone, and so I turn on speakerphone, I dial up the AT&T store. So I got AT&T on the left, AT&T on the right, and so I'm calling in, and I've got them both on speaker so they can hear each other, All right? And they can hear me, of course. By now, we're probably nearing two hours of invested time. By the time I get the guy on the phone, what's your name? My name's Adam. Okay. So I, I'm talking uh, to the guy on the phone at the store in Coeur d'Alene. I'm talking to the guy in wherever he was, Cincinnati or somewhere else. And uh, the guy on my cell phone says, just let me talk to the guy at the store. So I hold my cell phone over to the speaker. Okay. So these guys are talking to each other and I'm listening. And the guy at the store gets an attitude with the guy on my cell phone. He says, look, I've been working here long enough. I know how to do this. I don't need your help, and I'm going to hang up. Boom, and he hangs up the phone. <gasps> I'm panicking. I'm, you got to be kidding me. You just hung up. It took me 45 minutes to get you on the phone, and you're going to hang up? I'm your customer. I'm the one paying your salary. Oh, man, <laughs> I mean, I am losing it by now. Patience. Right? So the guy on the AT&T store in Cincinnati or wherever he is, he goes, oh man, I can't believe that guy just hung up on you. I says, yeah, I can't believe it either, but I have good news. He's in my town. <laughs> and so the guy starts wrapping up a few things with me on the phone and we're getting ready to hang up and he could tell I was ticked. I was ticked off. Now, good news is I didn't cuss. I only cuss for effect on purpose occasionally, but uh, when I'm really mad, I usually don't cuss, but I was ticked off, man. I mean, I was, I was ticked off. And it was pretty obvious I was ticked off because my machismo had been affected. And so the guy on my cell phone, knowing I'm ticked off and brings up the thing about the guy at the, at the store hanging up on me again. I said, don't worry, man. I'm going over there. And the guy says to me on the phone, he goes, are you a Christian? 
what? What did you say? He says, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am a Christian. By this time, I'm already calming down, <laughs> but not. And so he says, bro, I'm a Christian too. And he says, I just want to just exhort you, just take the high road. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I know you're right. Now, the, the good news and the bad news, he was right, I listened, I heard him, I responded to him correctly, but in the back of my mind, I was thinking, yeah, you're right, but he's in my town. And so I said to him, okay, thank you so much for uh, your help. And he says, um, as is customary with uh, you know, these uh, telephone type persons, um, he says, I just want you to know that my name is Emmanuel, and I hope I've provided you with excellent service today. <laughs> Emmanuel? <laughs> what? You've got to be kidding me. The guy on the phone is God with us. And it's Emmanuel. You can't be serious. I mean, I am wrecked. But not wrecked enough. This, I, guys, I'm not making this up. So it's a Thursday. Brenda's coming in to teach her Thursday night Bible study. And I've got Thursday night free. What am I going to do? Hmm. I went down, vented to a couple of people down there, getting ready for a one. All the kids are piling in and everything, and I'm getting ready. And I get in the car, and I decide, you know, I'm going down there. I'm ticked off. I'm so ticked off. And I go down to the AT&T store. Now, I already knew who the, the guy was that I was going to be dealing with. His name was Adam. Okay? Now, and so if you go down to the AT&T store and you see Adam, you'll know, right? And so... I, I am ready to just, I'm hunting for bear, man. And I even get down to the point where I'm at the AT&T store. It's dark now. I'm in the car. I'm looking in there. It's all lit up inside so I can see everything going on in the store. They can't see me. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about myself. And I thought, I got a bunch of cop friends. I'm going to call a cop friend to have them go in with me so that I don't do anything stupid. Because you never know what's going to happen. If, if I was in this kind of mood, and I go in there to bring some humility to this poor kid that needs humility, I'm going to, if he if he fires back, you never know, right? And so I thought, no, I'm not going to do that. If this guy is a jerk, I'm just going to uh, tell him what time it is. I'm going to lean down on him and, you know, intimidate him, you know? So he's with a customer. I decide I'm going to wait till the customer goes. By the way, don't you wish I was telling you this story about something that happened to your pastor years and years ago? Not like two weeks ago. You thought I was a really good guy, huh? Well, so I watch. He's with a customer. I know it's, it's got to be him. He's in the store. I know the location. And, and so I'm watching him with a customer and uh, then I see another person go in, and I, I, I wasn't going to go in until there was no customers because at least I had the courtesy. If I'm going to embarrass this guy, I'm not going to do it in front of other customers. And so another person goes in, and I go, oh, man, now there's going to be another customer in there. I'm going to have to uh, uh, deal with this. Uh, and so I wait a minute, and all of a sudden I notice that that customer went behind the counter. Oh, they work there. Okay. So I just said, that's it. I'm going in. So I get out of the car. I go marching in, and I must have had a look, man. I mean, I was ticked off. I, I was ready for bear, you know. And uh, well, occasionally, sadly, when I get in this kind of a mood, I must send a message of not being a super happy guy. <laughs> Happened the other day. I was at the skating rink, and as I walked through, I saw some trash on the ground, and I, that bugs me. And so I looked at the trash, and I looked up at the person that was looking at the trash, and then I was going to go over and pick it up. And before I could get over there to pick it up, the person that looked at me picked it up and put it in the trash. And I realized, oh, she must have thought I was mad that there was trash in the ground, and I was. But she picked it up to try to defuse the issue. And so I was thinking, uh, oh, I better go talk to her. And so I went over, hey, I'm really sorry about that. That wasn't your trash. I realized that. I was going to come over and pick it up, and, you know, thank you and all that stuff, trying to, you know, realize, oh, man, I must have a look, you know. So I'm going in this store, though, with a look intentionally. And I go in, and I look over at Adam. Then I decide, well, he's with a customer still. So the woman says to me, she says, how can I help you, sir? And so I said, uh, come around, come around the counter. So she comes out from around the counter, and 
by this time I've turned my back on Adam. And I've got her and she's just inches away from my face. And she's not the problem. I know that. And I tell her, I says, look, I realize you're not the problem. But I want to tell you what happened to me. And I tell her everything that just you just heard. And so by this time, um, I have got uh, her understanding the entire story. And I says, now, what is it that you do here? And she says, well, I'm the supervisor of 16 stores. And so I'm like, yes. You know, this, this guy's going down, you know. And so, by the way, a- afterwards, she says um, to me, she says, look, he's still with a customer. Are you going to wait? And I said, no, just make sure that you get this all fixed so that Carl can get his phone set up and, and I'll go. And she says, okay. And I said, I do want you to tell him that I came in, that the guy that he hung up on came in. And she says, I'll tell him. And she says, and you don't have to tell me who you are because I know who you are. Uh Uh-oh. You're the pastor of Candlelight, she says to me. Emmanuel on the phone. She knows who I am in the AT&T store. I mean to tell you. Does God have patience with us? Does God allow us to learn? Does God get our attention? You ever been in an environment like that where God is so gracious and merciful and he teaches you, Paul, is that really what you want to do? Is that what real manliness is? Do you really need to go humble that guy? Or could you just bear patiently when you suffer having done good? Amen, Lord. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. See, Jesus endured the suffering knowing what was coming. And I can do the same, and I need to do the same. In 1 Corinthians, we learn that there is no temptation taken you, but that which is common to man. But God is able with the temptation to make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. With the temptation, God could have said, hey, it's me, Emmanuel. Are you listening? Or to go in and have to even be further humbled. And then I said to the woman, how do you know me? And she goes, I attend your church. (laughs) Wow. I'm not proud of the moment, but you know what, guys? It is a great illustrator of the fact that God knows us. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. He wants us to know what it means to be real men, to be patient, to be obedient to the Lord, to be humble. Wow. To be a servant. Let's go to Revelation 19 in closing. I'm going to bring this to you again in several weeks. It'll be several weeks before we get there because we're going to talk about the crucifixion and the words from the cross and their meaning and the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. But I'm ultimately going to take you to a place where he makes mention as he's being tried, hereafter you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, seated at the right hand of the majesty. You know, that's amazing stuff. We'll get there. It's going to be weeks, weeks away, but we'll get there. But just listen to this. Uh, beginning in uh, verse 11 of chapter 19. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. This is in contradiction to the rider on the white horse earlier, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The, white, the rider on the white horse there is the Antichrist. This is now the Christ who is coming after the tribulation period, I saw heaven open to behold the white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. He himself had been judged. He was faithful, he was true. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns in opposed to that crown of thorns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies in heaven clothed with fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness, the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hail, King of the Jews. Behold the man. I want to be like him. I want to be obedient. This year, this new year, when people make all the resolutions, I, I don't make them. I know my humanness, but every day I say, Lord, I want to be obedient. And I do pray that in this year I'll be more than I was in the past. I want to be a servant. I want to be a servant to others. I want to be a servant to my wife, a servant to my children as a man, a real man, a servant. I want to be humble. I want to know who I really am, my own weakness, my shortcomings, and entrust to the Lord my life in a way that allows his strength to be in me, not my own machismo, but the strength of the Lord as a humble man, a real man. And I want to be patient. As we're working with others, as we're waiting for redemption, the redemption of our bodies, as we go through sickness, suffering, pain, trials, whatever it is that we may go through, that we'll be patient. Because you guys, Jesus knew the glory that was yet before him. He endured the cross, despising his shame, its shame. And the author of the Hebrews says, consider him who endured such hostility against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. I don't want to be weary in well-doing. I want to be patient. So in this new year, let us be men and women of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Allow us to grow as a result of your grace. And today, Lord, we do pray. Thank you for loving us in spite of us. Thank you for saving us in spite of us. You don't save us because we're good and because we've accomplished much. You save us out of your great love. We give you praise today. We thank you. And Father, thank you for sending not only your son to come and die in our place, but to send the Holy Spirit now to seal us, to equip us, to anoint us, to empower us to live. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. If this message has been a blessing, won't you please consider partnering with us? Send a financial gift of any size to Candlelight Fellowship, P.O. Box 2555, Hayden, Idaho, 83835. Join Pastor Paul Van Oy each Sunday and Wednesday for our online service or in person at 5725 North Pioneer Drive in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For service times and sermon recordings, visit candlelight.org.